I think most people are familiar with your work, at least at a, a superficial level, and that's why they're here. But for the uninitiated, why don't you uh, just in a couple of minutes talk, us, talk to us about when you had your first sort of epiphany about lean startups. Sure. So um, as Mary mentioned, I was my first 20 years of career was as an entrepreneur practitioner, I guess. I did eight startups, 21 years, um, four IPOs, and two craters of wheat. They left their own iridium layer, um, meaning uh, I learned a lot from the failures, uh, probably more so than I learned from the successes. Successes, you just think you're a genius, and failures after you stop blaming everybody else, you eventually have to own. Um, and uh, I, I remember thinking after I retired that uh, what the world really needed were my memoirs. Um, and so uh, I decided to write kind of some stories about what I learned in each one of those startups. And I would be writing that story, and then I'd do lessons learned, and then next story, and next story. I got about 80 pages into it. And uh, you have to understand, this is the turn of the century. When entrepreneurs believed that their journey was a singular one, meaning that there really wasn't any particular pattern. It was all about you and your particular technology or startup. And, and there was no there was no common heuristics. You were taught how to write a business plan, and that was it. And by the way, if somehow your plan didn't work, you know, there was your income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, you did a forecast, you personally failed. It was your failure. Um, and by that time, I was sitting on a bunch of uh, public boards and private boards and done enough startups. But I had seen enough deals, not as many as a venture capitalist, but a lot for an entrepreneur. And I realized, and I had just read uh, Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Any of you mm -hmm. still have to read that anyway? Yeah. It used to be required reading in journalism school. And basically, Campbell was a sociologist in the 1950s who read a ton of mythology from multiple cultures, Greek cultures and, and Chinese myths and um, uh, the Greek myths. And he noticed that the story about the hero, what he called the hero's journey, was identical from culture to culture, from you know Bronze Age to you know Middle Age to modern times. The, the story called a pattern of the hero gets called uh, to some journey. The hero denies the calling. Some tragedy happens, so the hero accepts the call. Uh, puts together a team of you know compatriots to go on this quest. Uh, the quest has physical and spiritual challenges, and at the end, there's either a physical or spiritual death and rebirth, where some insight happens. Now, if you recognize the story, it's the you know Iliad, it's the story of Moses, and it's the story of Luke Skywalker, um, <laughs> because uh, George Lucas actually stole the model from Campbell. And for at least 20 or 30 years, it's been the story of every action hero movie uh, uh, because that's what screenwriters use. My point was is that when I was thinking about this, I realized that the journey of a founder is actually the hero's journey. That it's a repeatable pattern. And no one had noticed this before because we were focused on the execution of a business plan. And so the first insight was, no, these aren't unique ev events. They're a common hero's journey. The second insight that, that came about, just thinking about it, was that startups were being taught in business school and by our potential investors like they were smaller versions of large companies. That is everything that a large company did, you were supposed to do. They were, were, were you teaching at this time? No, I was uh, thinking at this time. Um, <laughs> I eventually started teaching at, um, at uh, UC Berkeley Haas Business School. Uh, someone named Jerry Engel gave me a, an opportunity to teach. Um, I don't know, maybe all the faculty got run over that week or something. But, um, you know, and as an ex-marketeer, I think he was interested in somebody telling more stories. And in fact, I surprised him and actually said, no, I have a theory about entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what that was in a second. But the second insight was, as I said, that large companies wrote business plans, so we told startups to write business plans. The large companies hired sales and marketing people on day one, so we told startups to do that. Large companies executed known business models, and we just assumed that whatever you put on paper was correct as well. And I realized that was a mistake, that startups actually weren't executing, that they might think they were, but uh, startups actually <coughs> were searching for something. This distinction between execution and search is a huge idea. And so the second evolution of the idea was that we needed to be searching. <coughs> How do you search? 
Well, you don't search inside your building, you search outside of your building. And so the first book I wrote was called The Four Steps to the Epiphany, um, Echoes of Joseph Campbell. And uh, it, it was actually the beginning of what became the Lean Startup Movement. Is I taught a class based on that at Berkeley called Customer Development. And one of my students was a company from a co-founder of a company I founded named Eric Ries. And uh, I sat on Eric's board, funded his company, and he became the first practitioner of customer development. Um, and uh, Eric's observation was, hey, wait a minute, Steve. Talking about these activities outside the building, there's also something that engineers now know how to do, which is called agile development. And we need to put together customer development and agile development. And then Eric wrote a book called The Lean Startup. But those of you that have seen it probably uh, should be on your shelf as well. And then about three years ago, someone named Alexander Osterwalder wrote a book called Business Model Design. Um, excuse me, Business Model Generation. If you haven't seen that one, that should also be on your shelf. Turns out after about 10 years of thinking about all these pieces, this thing we call the Lean Startup has three components. One is that startups need to stop thinking about functional organizations. That is sales, marketing, biz dev, engineering. They need to be thinking about business models and what they know and don't know about them. And to keep score and to kind of articulate our hypotheses, we use Osterwalder's business model canvas to kind of help us describe the things we need to learn. Uh, because one of, the, uh, one of the insights I had after writing business plans for a couple decades and then after actually embarrassingly enough to admit I taught how to write business plans at, at Haas for a while is that we now know one certain fact about business plans and that is no business plan survives first contact with customers. It's a big idea. You know, if any of you are writing business plans in business school, um, you ought to turn it back in because no one else is reading it. Now, it doesn't mean that business plans are useless. They make lots of sense in an organization where there are a series of knowns. What's an organization with a series of knowns? Well, an existing corporation. You know who your customers are, you know who your channel is, you know pricing, you know competitors. There are a series of knowns. And if you're launching a follow-on product, a business plan makes all the sense in the world. No one ever said, though, well, wait a minute. A startup? Knowing all that stuff is actually an extreme corner case. In most cases in a startup, there's a series of unknowns. And we're using a planning document that actually is designed for knowns. What's the planning document for unknowns? And the answer was, well, for the last hundred years, business schools evolved a management stack for execution, not for search. If you think about what we've done since the first class at Harvard in 1908, graduated in 1910, is we've built the world's best management schools for you know, supply chain and operations and finance and whatever, all around graduating a cadre of managers who could administer and execute an existing company, Masters of Business Administration. No one ever said, well, wait a minute. Are those tools applicable when there are a series of unknowns, when unknown market, unknown customer, unknown application, unknown whatever, unknown pricing? And the answer was no, but no one actually worked on that stuff. What you're hearing from me and Eric and Alexander Osterwalder is the beginning of a management stack for search that are used by founders of startups. What was so, your question? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it was a great answer, though. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we'll reverse engineer the question. Whatever, whatever the answer was was the question. So does, does there become a point when you say, oh, well, we've done with search now, and now we're into execution. So right. let's get rid of Steve Blank right. and Osterwalder and Eric Reese and, and go back to good old uh, uh, management. So, so the answer is kind of yes. And here was the other uh, insight. So if you really think about it is, as you just described, well, Steve, OK, let's agree that there is value in execution. And all the stuff we do learn here at Columbia is valuable. It's just, where is it valuable? And gee, Steve, the stuff you're coming up with and others are for search. How do we go from search to execution, right? And so you would think, oh, it's pretty simple. I draw that box on search, and then I draw this box on execution, and there's a straight line between them. Sorry. Um, turns out it's not that simple. The first thing we needed was a definition of what a startup was. Now, I don't know, Murray, what you taught, but I remember teaching for a long time that Harvard definition is the pursuit of resources beyond. Independent of resources currently controlled. Yeah, and you know what? It sounds so cute. I have no idea what it means. I, if somebody else knows what it means, let me know. But I've, been, I've taught it for at least 10 years. 
And, and I still kind of look a student in the eye without giggling because it sounded good, but if I could keep a straight face, they would you know, go on and say, well, okay. Um, but I really wanted something actually a lot crisper that let them know what they were supposed to do after I said that. So my definition of a startup is as follows. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. It's a big idea. You should parse that. And because this is partly to answer your question. So the goal of a startup is not to become a startup. The goal of a startup is it's a temporary phenomenon. Your goal is to do what? What do you want to do? Become a, become a big company, right? So therefore, it's temporary. It's fun to bring your dog and have free food and all the free sodas and great, isn't it great? And it's band of brothers or brothers and sisters and blah, blah, blah. That's not the goal. You're having a good time. The goal, and by the way, then you go, oh, I get it. It's to search or build products or, you know, whatever, or, you know, or get customers. No, it's not. The goal is to search for something that's repeatable and scalable. Repeatable means if I did it on Monday, it works on Wednesday, and it works next week, which means that if your board members get you these great deals, those are bluebirds. <laughs> that's not repeatable, meaning it's not something you learned. It's, it was nice. I'll take that business. And scalable means, which sometimes... A lot of web startups forget is if I give you a dollar, I want more than a dollar back. Not like you proved to me you could actually get lots of users and lose money on every one of them. I actually want to know it's repeatable and ultimately scalable. Right? So I'm looking for repeatable and scalable, and what's the word business model? Business model is something interesting. That's the Oscar Walter definition that says instead of thinking about sales or marketing or manufacturing and a functional organization, we're going to start thinking about what are the components that I need in my company to know to create value for customers and revenue and profit for myself? And Oscar Walter says a lot. Every company needs to worry about what are you building? He calls it the value proposition. Whether it's a product or service or combination, who are you building it for? Customer segments. What's the channel? How do you get to even grow customers? What's the revenue stream, meaning revenue model and pricing? Do you need any resources, activities, partners, and costs? That's what you're worrying about in the early days. Once you find that, once you search for and found a repeatable and scalable business model, you would think, now I can take all the stuff I learned at Columbia and just execute. And here's the conundrum. It doesn't work that way. It turns out there's a secret box in the middle where the box on the left, think of that as a search, and the box on the right says execution. The secret box in the middle is the one called build. And if you're a founder, any founders of companies in, in this room? It's a memo you never get from your investors. It's the secret memo. Because that you're supposed to laugh. That secret memo says, fire the founder. <laughs> now some of you are not laughing at all. Uh, and, and the reason why is we should think about this. Think about this distinction between search and execution. Any of you are or know world-class founders? Anybody? All of you should be raising your hand who are founders, right? Um, anybody know or have met Fortune 1000 CEOs? Anybody? Are they the same type of people? No. You shouldn't even, like, no one should hesitate. The distinction is world-class founders are great at search. World-class Fortune 1000 CEOs are awesome at execution and strategy in the large companies. Have. We know, then, by definition, the people for search are different than the people for execution. So how do we go from search to execution? It turns out there's a set of organizational turmoil that needs to occur in any startup that has found a repeatable and scalable business model. Instead of being ad hoc, we need to put departments in. Gee, we never have an HR manual. Now the HR manual is 49 pages. Gee, we never needed expense reports. Now you need, you know, not only expense reports, but the expense report manual and the manual for how to use the manual. And the most important thing is sodas are no longer free. Um, <laughs> and no, no, that is a tell sign that uh, the early days are over. And what also happens is the management team that was great at search needs to transition to a management team that knows how to build and execute. And it turns out it's almost never, though there are exceptions, um, the founders who make that shift. It's why VCs, venture capitalists, bring in operating executives. Because great operating executives understand the value of the founders, 
but also understand that for investors to get liquidity, right, it's no longer search. It needs to go into execution. And this is why I call it the secret memo, because the founder's interest and the investor's interest typically here, which have been aligned, have now just become unaligned. What's an investor's interest? Ultimately, with all due respect, it's not your career as the founder. It's the liquidity event for the company you just put together. And you would think, in fact, here's what usually happens. Founder comes in, if they've been following some kind of process, they understand their goal is to find a repeatable and, and, and scalable model, and they're going to a board meeting, excited as heck. They've just found a repeatable model. They want to tell the board this thing is going to scale, it's going to be great. And they think, in fact, they're wearing their own sport coat because that's where they want the board to pin the medal on them. And they've cleared the aisles in the cube so the, the parade with the confetti could you know, go down the aisles and all the employees could throw confetti because they just see themselves that day as the board anointing them to scale the company and be that large company CEO. So in that board meeting, board members who in fact didn't even remember the name of your company, right? Remember, most professional investors of venture firms are sitting on 10 to 12 boards. They have to go to the parking lot and look up your name when they show up. You just think you're only seeing one board member every six weeks. They're seeing 12 different startups. But the minute you say, we have achieved profitability or we know how to scale, all of a sudden, they start looking at you in a way that's making you very personally that's really uncomfortable. Personally right uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> because what are they thinking? Anybody have any idea? What are they thinking? Are you the person that's going to achieve liquidity here? Or are you the crazy founder who is flying around the world, changing strategy 24-7, doing all of the things that took us to get here? But is that behavior and management skill set the one to take us to scale and liquidity? And that's where founders get unaligned. And by the way, I asked my VC friends, so why don't you just tell founders that this is going to happen? And after they look at me like, Steve, you are an idiot, aren't you? <laughs> they go, help us understand, Steve. So we want to be the one VC firm to let the potential people we want to invest in know we're going to fire them when they succeed? How is that going to work? That's why it's the secret memo. So startups go from search to build to execution. And we do a bad job in business school. We do a bad job in entrepreneurial education. We do a bad job as an entire industry of outing that fact that the skill sets change as you go from stage to stage. So, so what happens when, uh, so we switch from search to execution. Search to build to execution. To build to execution. Yep. Uh, and we fired the founder, yep. and we've now got a Fortune 1000 CEO in there. Uh, so what happens when that business model expires? Yeah, no longer generates. Uh, so for short-sighted VCs, um, uh, you know, it's been an M and A deal or an IPO, and they have the liquidity and they're done. Um, and that's the conundrum in this business for um, investors with longer-term views and investors that um, now have come out of being ex-entrepreneurs, like Andreas and Harvey's. In fact, will actually try to bet on potential founders who they think might be able to scale through that space. So what I'm working with is. Uh, uh, a great engineer I uh, worked uh, with at uh, Epiphany, George John, built a company called Rocket Fuel. And he's just uh, going to go north of $100 million. Bucks. He's just about to go public, and he's probably going to be the CEO all the way to a billion dollars. Uh, but those are rare. But if you're an investor, you could decide that that's a criteria you're looking for. So what I remind founders is when they're getting a first round and they have multiple offers, you should be so lucky. Here's the one question no founder ever used to ask is, Ask your investors, what percentage of the founders are still CEOs at a liquidity event? Go try that question. And they vary radically depending on the firm. But you just, in, in May, you wrote an article, it was the lead article in Harvard Business Review, that had a, yeah, a, great, a, laugh, un, a great unassuming title. Shall I tell you the title? Where is it here? Uh, Why the Lean Startup Changes Everything. So, uh, and uh, I think in that article, you were trying to address the issue of how do we do both these things? How do we do the search, but at the same time, whatever the business model, business models and the right. lifespan of the business model has become shorter and shorter and shorter. So whatever you're doing today, you're not going to be doing the same thing three, four, or five years from now. So how do you do these two sort of incompatible things, like tapping your head, rubbing your stomach, 
Uh, how can an organization be both efficient and innovative? Right. So that brings us to the issue about how does lean startup work inside a corporation? And in fact, what's going on in, in corporations today that they didn't have to deal with 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, and what's really interesting is every company in the world is struggling with um, what I call continuous disruption. Uh, that is, there's new, there are just new issues in the corporate world that 20 years ago you could own market share, the classic GE, I want to be one and two in the market and stay there for 50 years. You know, those life cycles, as you pointed out, are incredibly compressed. <coughs> one is because of China Inc. Two is, you know, globalization in general. Three is the barriers to entry for most industries are, have been lowered by, you know, a factor of 10 or more. Uh, the fact is uh, that consumers have almost instant visibility to pricing, uh, that trends change. So companies are now facing disruption on a rate that they never had. And so therefore, um, they have to deal with what I call continuous innovation or be out of business. Uh, and, and the biggest surprise for me, actually, after I wrote the HBR article, I had been out of enterprise software or the enterprise for about 10 or 15 years, was getting emails and calls from people with titles I had never heard of before, called the VP of Innovation or Chief Innovation Officer. And I, over half or three quarters of Fortune 1000 companies have this title. And they're trying to solve this problem in a way that's reminiscent of something that happened before. Why don't you ask me what happened before? <laughs> this is your cue. Steve, I've been thinking. Yeah. <laughs> what happened before? <laughs> so it turns out um, in the 1920s, U.S. corporations <laughs> went through a strategic shift. For those of you who know business history, uh, modern corporation in the U.S., kind of evolved from about 1870 to about the early 1900s. Uh, and we developed what was essentially functional organizations, sales departments, you know, manufacturing, finance, vertical organizations, and that's how we ran companies in the U.S. But by the 1920s, a number of companies were dealing with the vast geographic distances in the U.S. You needed that sales organization, that, that monolithic organization needed to deal with Salespeople in New York and San Francisco and manufacturing needed to deal with uh, a whole diverse set of products. For example, DuPont made everything from explosives to paints, but all they had was one manufacturing division and one sales division and one marketing division. And, and General Motors had, you know, they were making all these types of cars, but all they had was, you know, one organization. And all these companies were struggling with this strategic problem. How do we do, deal with vast geographies, and how do we deal with diverse product lines? Not just one company, but all of them. And unknown to each other, they were all running structure experiments, which is a fancy term for they were all trying new organizations. Uh, 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 a guy named uh, Albert Chandler wrote a great book on this called Strategy and Structure, who was at Harvard in the 60s. And what they all ended up doing was inventing something called the visualization, right? The modern corporation today, you could organize like a functional organization, but you could also organize in divisions. And first DuPont, then General Motors, then Standard Oil, then Sears all adopted this common organizational structure to deal with a strategic problem. Why am I giving you the corporate history in the 1920s? We're dealing with the same class of problem today. The current corporate structure functional organizations or divisionalization or matrix has broken down in the age of continuous disruption. We need a new class of organization to deal with the fact that what we have are business units responsible for P&L trying to innovate and an M&A group here trying to buy innovation and a corporate VC group over here and an advanced R&D group over here and by the way, just to throw it in the mix, we just hired a VP of innovation and gosh knows what their charter is. Uh, but we have not declared that the problem isn't adding another person to the org chart. We've not declared that the problem is a strategy problem that we need to think about first and then the organization. And, and the strategy problem is the need for continuous innovation for survival. Right. So, so, for so, example, give, so, so give us your ideas of what this new organizational structure might look like. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. But, um, <laughs> uh, don't do that. So uh, uh, 
Rita McGrath, who teaches here, just came out with a marvelous book which describes a, a good chunk of this problem. Um, but uh, Alexander Ankewalder and I and Hank Chesborough from Berkeley, who works with uh, Open Innovation, are going to propose a, a potential structure that basically um, that basically kind of flattens innovation and makes it a, a, a continuous theme across the organization. And it's going to uh, piss off a lot of people. Meaning, if you're you know currently running a PL and someone says, "Well, let me tell you how you need to share this stuff," or if you're the head of M&A, and we now say, no, 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 M&A is not some separate function. It's now an integral part of uh, the, uh, the innovation core. You're also going to be mad. So before we go out, but we are going to make a proposal of what the strategy and structure should look like. So are, are we, we then try it out on a couple of companies? Are we then going to have a, uh, then a three-stage model? We'll search, we'll build, we'll execute, and then we'll no, innovate? I so I, the, the word execution will now mean continuous execution or continuous innovation. Right. Uh, simply because, and I'll give you the one example, and this was Rita's insight, which I thought was brilliant. Again, I'll go back to the GE rule where we used to teach you needed to be one or two in a market. That's fine, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a new market around you, and you're going to invest in all that tooling and hardware and whatever. Great, I'm going to create another market, which actually will take most of your customers and revenue, congratulations, you can own this business. And so new market creation is actually an opportunity we couldn't do 20 years ago because we couldn't move that fast. But in most industries, you can now actually do that. Want to see an example? Uh, anybody know what Tesla is? Right? Draw a straight line on that battery technology line, and there's no more big three in 20 years. Right? This, is, this is a math problem now, not a, this is not a, you know, maybe. They've just now proven that all you need to do is ride down the battery technology curve and you know, in about, you know, whether you believe five years or 10 years, you're gonna have $25,000 cars that uh, will have no internal combustion engines and uh, outperform anything out there. Um, you know, the same is true the other way is the fracking. We go the other way, we draw the other curve and we go, gee, the US is energy independent in another line, which I think by the way, those lines are ironically uh, superimposed. Um, so sometimes this disruption is actually not just simply a math problem. But I, I still want, I want to hear more about your thoughts, uh, and I don't want you to kill me uh, uh, to get the, your ideas, but um, do you imagine that uh, you will have divisions or units within large organizations that are dedicated to innovation and others are more dedicated to execution, or does it become like a 3 model where everyone is to take 15% of their time and they have to be ambidextrous, if you like? Yeah, so, so the answer is there's been a series of companies with best practices and also what I'll consider worst practices. Best practice, so it's not like we've never seen this before, it's just we've never seen it when we really needed it. So in the 70s and 80s, uh, Hewlett Packard at its peak created 45 new divisions um, and created a series of products. One guy did it, one guy, Chuck. Um, does anybody know the IBM PC story, how that happened? Right? IBM, you know, said, oh, you know, what's this PC, Apple II stuff? And it came out in a board meeting that the CFO was actually using Apple IIs to generate the board <laughs> finance stuff. And they said, wait a minute, we're a mainframe company. What the hell is this? And they basically gave uh, uh, <coughs> one guy, Don Esperts, <coughs> 12 people. And they said, you know, 12 people, there's no way you could do this in, uh, in uh, Armand. You'll be buried by the bureaucrats. Um, go to the furthest place we know on the East Coast. So he picked Boca Raton, Florida, where you needed a passport if you were under 75 years old, um, and created an independent division, and the rest is history. Went to uh, Microsoft to get languages, uh, went to digital research to get an operating system, and if you know that story, uh, um, Jerry Gilbo was out flying, and his wife uh, would have signed the NDA for uh, IBM, and so IBM went back up to Microsoft to ask this kid, Bill Gates, who was going to give them their programming languages, did he know anybody with an operating system? And Bill Gates said, oh, funny you ask, we have an operating system. And his co-founder, Paul Allen, kicks him on the table, we don't have an operating system. <coughs> and Bill says, oh, this is Friday, come back on Monday, we'll demo our operating system to you. <laughs> and Paul Allen goes, Bill, <laughs> can't write an operating system on a weekend, I'm good, but, <coughs> and he said, no, 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 they wanted a CPM operating system. Bill, where are we going to get one? And Bill Gates says, 
Remember that company that tried to sell us this thing called, the, you know, I forgot what it was called, DOS, um, you know, for $25,000 called Seattle Silicon? Why don't you go across town and offer them 50 grand for it? So the rest was history. They bought DOS that weekend from Seattle Silicon <coughs> and made Bill Gates the richest man in the world because he demoed it to IBM and they adopted DOS. I'm sorry about the shaggy doc story, but um, <coughs> in any case, innovation. Um, needs to be protected in an enterprise. Um, and it needs to come from people in a culture um, that are allowed to fail. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to give you a good example. Um, one of the things I tell entrepreneurs uh, from foreign countries who come to Silicon Valley is that we have a special word for a failed entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Do I know what that special word is? Experience. It's a big idea. In an entrepreneurial culture, failure does not mean fail. It means you ran an experiment and screwed it up. You don't lose your job. You know, you might lose your company, but you get to have multiple shots at a goal. Now think about in an execution organization. Now this goes back to your question. Mm -hmm. Where I have a culture that says, here's your job spec. Here's your job title. We've been doing the same job for 25 years. You fail. Well, it must be because you're incompetent. And therefore, we're going to fire you or remove you from your job. So to do experimentation in that culture where failure equals stupidity or you didn't quite, you were failing to perform. So we need to change the rules inside the corporate culture that says there are some jobs that are execution, but there are some other jobs where the culture says we expect failure, mm -hmm. right? Most of you understand 90% of startups fail just outright, outright. Well, imagine like 90% of what you were doing inside of a company would fail outright. So number one, the culture needs to change. Number two is, and, and you mentioned the percentage of budget for R&D. Number two is unless you're committed to that type of tax on your existing divisions, you are gonna be a short-term trajectory company. And I think we're gonna have two types of companies. One which makes Wall Street happy for about five or 10 years. And you want to be investing in, and buying stock that looks like this. Uh, but because then they're not investing in innovation, that's about their market window. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be other companies that say, no, 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 we're going to have lower earnings. In fact, it's the Amazon model that says, screw you guys. Here's what we're investing in. We're going to be here for the next 20, 30, 40 years because we've put a tax on our own uh, profits. And, and, and these winning companies, do you think there will, as with the divisional structure that Chandler talked about, there will be one identifiable? You bet. Uh, so this is not a menu of things that work in some circumstances and no. others, or you think there'll be enough of a cohesive? So just like divisionalization, right? There's not a way to divisionalize, but you know a, the distinction when you look at an org chart between a functional organization and a divisionalized organization, you know, one with corporate staff and then power in the divisions. Uh, what I'm going to propose, and, and I've been talking to, uh, as I said, Oscar Walden and, and, and Chesborough, is I'm going to propose you will look at this and you go, whoa, are you going to pull this off? And maybe not, but it will at least try to make the point that there's a different type of organization. And it requires uh, the people who historically have had the power, which are the P&L divisions, to realize that they're, it's the wrong word, not short-term players, but they're not there forever. And, and that's a really hard thing to get in corporate, is that while it might seem like, yes, you're at your peak, and yes, this division is really making all the money for the company, it's all transitory. And, and, and Let, let's shift gears. Let's yeah. talk about uh, the NSF and i which I know has been a fabulous uh, success. And actually, in New York, Columbia is part of one right. of these I-Corps programs. Uh, so uh, tell us how the NSF adopted the Lean Startup model and how you're measuring your progress. So uh, just for, for background, uh, this Lean Launchpad class, which I teach here, Stanford, Berkeley, taught a couple <coughs> hundred other places now, uh, has now been adopted by the National Science Foundation as the basis for commercializing all science in the United States. Period. End of discussion. Um, and how this happened was when I first taught the class at Stanford, I decided to blog the class because it was a science experiment. And I would write about, here's what I taught in class one and two and three. And even my co-author, Bob Dorf, 
that was the most boring blog series I ever wrote. Because, you know, here's what I did, here's what worked, here's whatever. But I thought there might be somebody reading it. And about 30 days after the class ends, I get a phone call. You know, ring, ring, ring. Hi, hi. Steve, you don't know me. I'm from the U.S. government. We need your help. Now, because <laughs> I'm a smart ass, I went, hey, you know, the government got my help for four years during Vietnam. I'm kind of done, you know. <laughs> Who are you? He said, well, I'm, you know, Errol Arkelik. I'm the program manager for the SBIR program in NSF. And, uh, you know, and blah, blah, blah. He started talking. I said, what's the NSF? And he like, you can sit here. He said, National Science Foundation? I said, what's that? Now, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a $7 billion government organization that funds all basic science research except for medical <coughs> in the United States. If you're a university professor or grad student in, uh, doing basic science, the odds are you're going to apply for an NSF grant. And what you may not know is Congress 30 years ago required all government research organizations, NSF, NIH, <coughs> DOD, DARPA, etc., to put away essentially 3% of all their funds for any scientist who wants to commercialize any technology that they've invented. And that's called the SBIR program. Another side program is called SB. The good news is we do this as a country. The bad news is Congress never bothered to ask in those 30 years, so how are you doing with those investments? Uh, because essentially, we've been giving away cars without requiring driver's ed. And the returns have been horrific. Why? Because you give the scientists half a million bucks, what are they going to do? More science. Uh, but not really know like, like how to build a company. And so when Errol read this stuff, he said, you just invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship. And I would have never made that claim. But he said is, what you're requiring your students to do is hypothesis testing. Well, Steve, scientists have spent their whole lives hypothesis testing. You're just making them do it outside the building. So why don't you uh, put together a class for scientists and engineers? Make a very long story short, we prototyped the class, and then it was so successful, we taught University of Michigan and Georgia Tech how to teach it, and then we taught 11 other universities, including Columbia, to be part of the program. We now teach 400 uh, teams a year uh, in the US who want to commercialize their probably one of the largest uh, incubators and accelerators in the country. Um, or right up there, on how to commercialize their science. And what happened about a month ago is I got a call that says, well, we've kind of changed the program. Well, what happened? Well, for the last couple of years, we've been holding this, uh, uh, what's called the NSF Innovation Corps. It's been voluntary. That is, if you wanted to get an SBIR grant, you didn't have to take this class. So we have data now, going back 30 years, about how successful have been those people who didn't take the class. That is, when they apply for a grant or, or venture capital funding, what's their success rate? And the answer is unchanged, about for 30 years, 18%. <coughs> well, why are you calling me? Well, we just actually got the data from what happened to the people who took the innovation core. What's their percentage success? 60%. And they said, we just stopped the program for the people not taking the class because we believe it's unethical to continue the experiment. <laughs> uh, so now in the United States, it's required to even show up at the SBIR conference. You have to watch my lectures and talk to 20 <laughs> customers. Um, and so that is some real data. Now, by the way, with all the caveats, funding isn't an indication of success as a company and blah, blah, blah. But these are peer reviewed, you know, this is a peer review thing. So it, 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 there is some meaning that there's probably some value in taking this class and doing this process. What this happened? What happened though is um, uh, so the National Science Foundation adopted this. Then ARPA E, which is the Energy Department, adopted this for commercialization. And then I got chased by uh, a school called UCSF that um, teaches life sciences, and uh, they said we want you to do this class for life sciences. And I said, it won't work for life science. You know, it's you know you have a, a target and you build a, you know, a biologic drug for oncology that is a cure for cancer, and all you need to do is figure out where the bags of money go. You know, what do you need <laughs> customer development or lean startup process? And they said, Steve, you really don't understand how this works, do you? I said, no. It's a, and they said, well, what you just talked about is a very small corner case about all the money being invested in, you know, therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, and digital health. Uh, 
and in fact that life sciences venture capital has just collapsed in the last couple of years because no one's making any money. But the problem is, is we were investing in all this stuff, and we really were investing in all the science without, again, asking them did they understand anything about business. We've just run this experiment. Does it work? Sounds a little like the experiment you were running for the NSF. So make a long story short, we're now offering this class for life sciences starting October 1st. And this time, instead of waiting for the results, the National Institute of Health is sending their own teams here, and hopefully they're going to adopt this program for how we, do, how we commercialize life sciences in the United States in 2014. And so my goal is to change how all of our government research organizations commercialize our uh, basic science. Um, and after that, and I don't know, I'll rest on the seventh day or something. But, um, <laughs> uh, it's been kind of a lot of fun. So I'm going to open it up for questions in just a minute, but I have one uh, sort of last topic I want to touch on. Uh, and I think the original sort of lean startup was around technology business yep. and internet businesses. <coughs> now you've gone on to basic science business and even life sciences, uh, where as you say, you wouldn't think that this methodology would apply. Uh, how about the garden variety, mom and pop, dry cleaner, laundry, uh, lawn service kind of business? So I, I got to tell you, the nice part about being um, not an educator by training, but an entrepreneur, it, is I, I would end up showing up in some of my peers' classes just to see what they were teaching and realize, I must be stupid. I don't get this stuff. So I got to tell you my first I don't get this stuff to tie this in here is, I thought I knew what a startup was. Right? I did startups for 20 years. And to me, a startup is, I woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to make a billion dollars. <laughs> and I'm going to take over some portion of the universe. Or else, why bother getting up in the morning? <laughs> That's what a startup is. And I walk into some other class, they're teaching something completely different. I'm going, maybe I don't understand this. And the answer was, it turned out, anybody ever hear the apocryphal story that Eskimos have 43 words for snow? Anybody ever hear that? Turns out it's not true, but it sounds good. Okay? <laughs> uh, it, Oh, somebody's going, really? It's not true. Let me tweet that. Um, <laughs> it turns out that we have one word for startup and entrepreneur. And it turns out it describes six very different things. But we were teaching it like it was one. And, and we were applying it like it was one. For example, um, I live near the beach, as Murray mentioned, in California. People surf in that part of California. Um, and actually, they surf fast because they're great white sharks, so they become very good at surfing <laughs> fast. Um, but in any case, you will see uh, people who love to surf signs on their surf shack that says, surfing lessons, 9.15 to 10.45. That's a joke, but you ought to laugh because they are, in fact, entrepreneurs who are working so they could live their lifestyle. These are lifestyle entrepreneurs. They own their own business. They're innovative about what they teach. But they're really not interested in building a business or even hiring anybody other than to keep the surf shop open. That is one class of entrepreneur. There's a second class, which you talked about, called small business entrepreneur. That's what my parents were. They came over as immigrants to this country. Uh, they worked in sweatshops for the first 10 years to earn enough money to open a grocery store. And in fact, that was their goal. Was you know, they didn't want to open a chain of grocery stores. They didn't want to work for anybody anymore. And they wanted to feed the family. And the type of people they could hire was my sister and I and, you know, like my drunk brother-in-law or my parents. I mean, that was it. You know, that was like the best thing. And by the way, there was no way they could raise venture capital because in small businesses, the returns are not interesting enough to attract any uh, risk capital. It's a big idea. And by the way, back then there wasn't the SBA, so they like scrounge money from you know relatives and, and um, uh, fraternal organizations. So lifestyle entrepreneurs, small business entrepreneurs. Then what I did was what Silicon Valley did: scalable startups. People woke up crazy enough to want to change the world, and equally crazy investors. Big idea. Equally crazy financial asset class, which Boston lost and Silicon Valley got, and New York has back. Um, where they equally matched the insanity of the founders. They said, yeah, sure, let's lose 90% of our money. Um, <laughs> sounds like the housing market. But, in, but instead, uh, but we think we might find a Google or a Facebook or an Apple in that pile. There's a new class of entrepreneurs, and I am answering your question ultimately, 
That's I call viable startups. Web, mobile, you know, wherever where I could start it for a hundred grand on my credit cards and flip it for some M and A deal for ten to twenty million bucks. Profitable for everybody. Different from scalable, but still tech. Then there's corporate entrepreneurship, which we talked about. Different rules, different things going on. And then there's social entrepreneurship, which to me is a uh, contradiction in terms. But um, still, it's I have very different goals. I'm not going for profitability. I might be going for double bottom line. It turns out that you teach these differently, you fund them differently, you think about them differently. And the mistake we made both as entrepreneurs, educators, and finance people is we like talked about them as, oh, startups and entrepreneurs. You need a taxonomy to understand which one are you trying to do and what are the goals. To answer your question, uh, I thought about this for a while and realized that 99%, uh, in fact, the number is 99.7% uh, of all companies in the US are under 500 people. Right? Um, it's an amazing number. 50% of all non-governmental employees work for these small businesses. The US is still a nation of small businesses. Yet if you want to get funded by a bank through an SBA loan, a Small Business Administration loan, guess what they do? They make you write a business plan. So what do we now know? No business plan survives first contact with customers. But banks are asking you to fill out a document, which we now know is zero predictor of your success. So what would we do instead? Well, instead of teaching small businesses about business model canvas and a formal process, we could actually ask them some simple questions to approximate what's on that canvas. Like, do you ever work in a restaurant? I understand you want to start one. Do you ever, ever bother to? Really, your cousin has this empty building on the edge of town. You want to set that up in? Do you ever stand out there and count the cars at night to see if anybody drives by? Oh, you know, you need this amount of money? Where'd that come from? Oh, you just used Excel? Well, do you ever actually think that is we can actually talk somebody through a customer development process and say, hmm, you want to do a bit of breakfast? Have you ever worked in one? Well, why don't you come back after you spent 30 days actually working in one and tell me you'd rather do this. And so I've been trying to get the White House OSTP to work with the SBA, and we're making a push to try to change the heuristics on how we um, actually talk to small businesses. And the goal is to reduce infant mortality here. And of all things that could affect our economy is if we could actually decrease infant mortality. I make no claim that these will make companies more successful. I will claim if you go through this thinking process and, and this testing process, we can build a bounding box to eliminate the egregious stupid errors we now know most founding companies make because we, we've now seen 50 years of this stuff. So the answer is the last thing uh, I'm trying to do is change how small businesses are are started in the U.S. as well. Well, that was interesting when you said you're not necessarily going to make the local laundry uh, venture capital investable business, but you can uh, stop the mortality rate and you can help uh, the, the small ones be. Sure, because we now know it's, I mean, if you just think about it as a thought experiment, let alone if any of you have actually started a small business, uh, much like in startups, there's a, there's a lot of enthusiasm and passion behind founding uh, a founding event. But very little thought about what are the skill sets or the things you need to know or worry about. So if we almost had a checklist that enforced the, really, you want to do X and you've never done it before? Come back. Here are some places you could work for free for 30 days. Come back and see if you really want to do this after you know washing dishes or trying to sling some hash in a restaurant. See what that feels like. And tell me you want to go do that before you want the $100,000 loan. Or have you done that? Oh, good. Now let's go to the next step is, you know, who do you think your customers are? And you could be asking those questions in a way that doesn't involve a fancy plan that translates them into the key things we know fail about small businesses. And, and again, it's the same heuristics we're, we're teaching.